<laughs> okay, <coughs> then we continue with this uh, this procedure of of actually calculating um, energy consumption and hence uh, emissions. We have <coughs> discussed this aspect very briefly on the blackboard. The main engine power, workload, uh, fuel consumption, standard fuel consumption. I've used kilograms per uh, kilowatt hour instead of, uh, of grams, but that doesn't matter. And we can then <laughs> calculate the direct fuel consumption. I'm not, I'm, I didn't discuss the auxiliary engine powers there. It can easily be, be included. <coughs> Uh, the key here for the main engine uh, thing is, is then the workload and of course the other data uh, there. And then <coughs> we, uh, we, uh, we have distance divided by speed to get the time that we are underway. So of course the, the operating speed will affect the time, transport time. And then you are of course in in real life, when 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 you are going to do such calculations, you cannot slow steam with perishable goods like salmon on board from uh, let's say western northwestern Norway and to 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 the continent, because you could you can actually there are technologies for uh, for uh, for transporting cargo li like fresh salmon from uh, from uh, from the this part of the country and to, to, to Europe but uh, <coughs> you cannot slow steam then that will not work so so uh, so you also need to take let's say the supply chain needs into consideration and not not perform unrealistic exercises uh, there are certain constraints that you need to pay attention to and then <coughs> you uh, uh, can then um, calculate the fuel consumption for the relevant leg, because then you have the consumption per hour calculated like this, and then uh, then uh, you uh, you can um, you can calculate the consumption in in different scenarios with and without slow steaming, for instance. You can include the pre-chain, as I said, let's say the energy use connected to, to handling the, <coughs> the cargo, or, uh, which may vary between ship and road transport. There may also be issues connected to indirect energy use by employing a certain vessel. So if you, <coughs> you can consider the production the energy that is is used for production of the of the vessel or the vehicle, and you have no chance to derive the, those numbers. You need to rely on uh, on uh, on studies which has gone into that. But on average, the pre-chain use is counting for around twenty percent, ten to twenty percent. And then you, uh, you uh, calculate the primary energy consumption, which so you end up here, so to speak. Before, we need then to take the payload capacity into consideration and the uh, average load before we sort of continue with the final calcula calculations. And then <coughs> uh, we have the average load factor, because <coughs> you have to remember that we are talking about a row, roll on, roll off ship here, which transports trucks. So we have the payload of the truck at the outset, and then you you are uh, calculating then the actual HGV payload, and you have the need for capacity in terms of lane meter requirements on the ship and then you can easily derive then the cargo per active lane meters which is actually the lane meters employed by a, by a, by a truck and then you get <coughs> a vessel cargo payload here and 
this is kind of interesting because you have a kind of a double load factor prob problem here. Because <coughs> you, you need also to take the, the weight of the truck into consideration when you, when you consider the payload. Because the ship may have a defined constraint on how much, how much uh, load you can put onto a ship, right? So if the, if, the, if the cargo part of it is the dimensioning factor, you may, you may not be able to fill it with full, fully laden trucks because the trucks themselves weigh quite a lot. <coughs> and that has uh, actually been not taken seriously into, into, into consideration in some of the studies that are done, let's say, before 2005. You may fa find studies which takes they s they they add cargo weight and truck weight, and they call it cargo load factor. But it's not cargo only cargo. It's also the truck the way of weight of the truck, <coughs> which reduces kind of the efficiency with respect to cargo. So you get the point, the double load, you, you, you load a vessel onto a truck, uh, onto a ship, uh, sorry, you load a vehicle onto a ship, and the vehicle in itself has a certain, and quite actually quite high weight, weight. So you need to take that into consideration as well when you consider cargo payload efficiency here, which may actually be quite low for certain types of ship, ships. You can imagine easily if you <coughs> if you compare a Roro ship and the uh, and the uh, and the freight carrying capacity, focusing on freight, and compare that with a bulk ship, freight uh, which transports oil, gas, particularly oil, or grain, whatever. So the 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 cargo carrying capacity is much more efficient there. So bulk transport, as compared to road transport of the same cargo, is efficient in almost all of the cases. And bulk transport has been sort of put forward by the, by the, by the interest groups that are in favor of ship transport. They have said that, well, ship transport is very energy efficient, but then they have actually focused on bulk transport. So for bulk transport, it's true, that statement, but for this type of transport, it's not necessarily true, as, as we shall see a bit later on. But you need to <coughs> take the cargo payload into consideration and then you get the primary energy consumption per ton. So we get numbers like this, and you can divide it by tons transported, and you get the number, which you can use for comparison between sea transport and, uh, and road transport. So <coughs> this kind of exercise is, is, uh, is, is it's very le relevant for, uh, let's say, pallets, containers, roll on, roll off, where you can uh, can get some uh, rather surprising numbers out of this comparison between sea and road transport and, and rail transport, uh, where you need to take the distances and the way you operate the vessels and the payload into consideration. Heavy goods vehicles. Lots of abbreviations. 
But I think here, <laughs> this is kilowatt hour, but I think here it's uh, the ME and AE is okay. It's main engines and auxiliary engines. And then we have this HJV thing. So we can tr just examine these, these five cases. And um, in, a, in a study like this, you, you should start from the beginning and try to show in a transparent way what you are actually going to do. And you start with the distances. And here you ha have the distance in kilometers from Trondheim to Paris by different cases divided by the road transport and the sea transport distance. So we split the total distance into sea and road, which is, uh, is, is it's a base for, for the calculations. This is um, necessary data, and they are relatively easy to obtain by using Google Maps and uh, things like that. And the <coughs> we have the description of each case uh, on the left-hand side, where um, as a point of departure for the study. I'm not going into the details of the calculations. In principle, they are like this, with different speeds, different relationships between service speed and operating speed based on reasonable assumptions. And uh, the engine size varies with, sh with, uh, with ship types. For the high-speed ferry, has has significantly larger engines than the than the short ferry, for instance, which goes at the service speed of around 12 knots across the the English uh, Channel. Then, and the medium ferry is somewhere in between, with a service no speed of around 17 knots. The high speed is. I think it's 22 or 23 knots. So here we see that <coughs> the primary energy consumption calculated like this, taking also the road part into consideration, where you have, let's say, a, a, a truck with, uh, with 500 horsepowers. Translate that into kilowatts. Uh, get data for the for the for the load engine load average engine engine load for a truck, which then need to be found somewhere, and then you need to go on uh, on the library to the library or to Google or to whatever source and try to work that out. But <coughs> as seen from this calculation, it's quite critic that the sources are reliable here. But it's the same procedure for truck transport as for 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 sea transport. But we see here that the primary energy consumption per ton cargo transported from Paris to, to um, Trondheim or vice versa varies quite a lot. We see that uh, the road transport is actually the, the winner here when it comes to, to energy consumption, based on reasonable assumptions. And the two long ferries <coughs> with, a l with a long sea stretch, as can be seen uh, from here, it's, uh, it's second to, to, to the longest distance, but the sea leg is long. And again, because it's a roll-on, roll-off uh, vessel, and combined with the double load factor that you need to load the truck and which is carrying the cargo, you get numbers like this. So when <coughs> when when the interest group that was fighting for EU funds to set up this. set up this service because uh, there was a, a 
much work done to get EU funding of this uh, this new sea route based on two ferries. And then this article came along, which concluded that it is not a really a good idea in terms of uh, coping with EU targets on emission reductions. You shouldn't do this. So it was kind of it was a quite uh, lively discussion about the results here, to 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 say the least. <coughs> and then it's easy when you have the energy consumption to to just transfer that to uh, approximately by um, by just calculating the the CO2 emissions which will then give the same ranking of uh, emissions between the five cases with road transport is the best one and then the two long ferries is is the least favorable one in terms of uh, of energy consumption and then we can say that, well, if you want to compare it, uh, you can p compare it by using metric ton on ton kilometers, and you get more or less the same ranking. But uh, this is per ton kilometer, where you measure it along this, this axis, and this is the scale for uh, metric ton. You see that uh, measured in terms of of uh, ton kilometer, it's uh, it's a bit in favor of the of the sea transport leg. That has to do with capacity. So <coughs> the the difference is elaborated in the article, but it doesn't change the the ranking here. And this is consumption. NOx emissions. <coughs> Again, because of the slides that I showed you, that road transport has tried to really do something with with NOx, the sea transport legs, where which is dominated by 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 ship transport, is is doing quite quite bad on this uh, indicator as compared to road transport. Uh, sulfur, <coughs> the same. But sulfur, emissions of sulfur is connected strongly to the use of heavy marine fuel oil or bunker, bunker oil. So uh, sulfur is less of a problem for, uh, for diesel than for heavy bunker oil. But this is going to change from next year on from 2015 because then the 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 seca directive is is uh, put into operation where sulfur the uh, amount of sulfur in uh, in heavy marine oil is going to be redu reduced to 0.1 percent and this will change this this these numbers uh, drastically so the fuel is cleaned for for sulfur. Then we can start to play a bit with with uh, with uh, load factors and try to <coughs> to vary, for instance, the ship load factor in uh, in various uh, various scenarios. Um, the black um, black bars are base, and then we have a scenario A which is the, the highest load factor, and then you have a medium load factor of 55%. Uh, or a actually a rather low load factor. So between 55 and 85%. So it's, uh, it's a way of illustrating what can be achieved if you do something about this variable, the load factor. And you see that uh <coughs> The road transport is is a bit insensitive to to the ship load factor, which is uh, goes without saying. 
and uh, and uh, and um, the differences are larger the larger the share of the distance uh, that is carried by uh, by by ship of course you see that it varies quite a lot this is the energy consumption per metric ton and uh, load factor has a has an impact here quite quite strong impact for this uh, particularly for the two long ferries if you have a high load factor you are down to some 1700 kilowatts per metric ton and if you are not good at uh, at uh, increasing the load factors you are up to 2000 600 for 2500 it's quite a large difference you can also play around with uh, let's say what we call the row pax factor the share of cargo in ton as a fraction of the passenger or as a fraction of the total carrying capacity of the ship. It's another way of illustrating the load factor ratio. Again, with a rather strong impact for the, for the cases with the longest sea leg here. And these are um, scenarios uh, based on different types of ships so I think this is the this is the row pax factor of 20 30 40 percent depending of the on the type of ships that are used during the the transport as we remembered some of the cases had a combination of uh, short ferries and the longer ferries and so on so we will you will get this uh, quite clear when you read this uh, this paper speed is always interesting as I try to indicate here you haven't much to play with when it comes to road transport so uh, but this is uh, main engine workload on, on ships again the largest uh, effect on on this um, the, the longer sea legs but you see the differences are quite quite high if you uh, these are these bars are actually the effect of of, uh, of slow steaming if you remember this exponential figure you can find out that 50% uh, <coughs> main engine workload corresponds to let's say a service speed of around 70% or something of the maximum speed so speed matters quite a lot and of course in the in the end this is uh, this is affecting the profitability of the services so it's a trade-off there between between op uh, operating speed <coughs> as a fraction of the service speed and and the lead time needs for the customers. So you could argue or negotiate, I mean, negotiate with the customers to say that, well, if you get these, uh, this type, this cargo tomorrow instead of today, I will gain quite a lot of money in terms of uh, s fuel savings and we can perhaps and then you can think in terms of giving the customer an incentive to accept that by giving a discount you say that well if, if we slow steam we can save the environment for uh, some emissions and I um, I as a transport company will save an amount of money in, uh, in uh, costs and we split the benefits in some fraction, 50-50 or whatever. If you don't do that, and that this has to do with supply chain integration in practice. If you don't do that, if you, if you just try to persuade your customer to 
accept the next day deliverance instead of today without giving any incentives, you may get a very clear answer, which is no way. I won't accept that. But the mechanisms are quite simple. If you introduce some incentives, like profit sharing, you could achieve something, which is perhaps for the benefit for, for all of us in the, in the, in the, end, uh, in the end here. So <coughs> it's not easy to defend Ropex shipping as, a, as an environmental friendly uh, solution. You need a high load factor, <coughs> you need a distance advantage, and you need this uh, new, uh, which will now, the third point will be sort of taken care of from 2015 on with the SECA agreement on 0.1% uh, sulfur content in the, in the fuel. Uh, NOx abatement technology and slow steaming. This, this needs to be in place for, for the Ropax shipping to be in the area of road rail transport to be, to be competitive. Which was, when this uh, paper was published, a bit of a surprise because there had been sources, uh, academic sources, which actually carried wrong numbers when it come to came to uh, to load factors in particular, because they had disregarded the double double load factor problem. Second case, <coughs> so typical short sea connections. It's always, as researchers, it's very uh, quite of quite fun to dig into such cases because short sea shipping has gained quite a lot of attention in the EU with the. Uh, lot of grants to improve the solutions, to build new ships, and, uh, and so on. So it's, it's good then to see what, what will happen, and how are the competitive situation as compared to road ra and, uh, and rail transport. And these are two, these are uh, <coughs> four trans-European transport legs from Gothenburg to Rotterdam and to Edinburgh. Uh, links where there are is quite a lot of, uh, of uh, freight going on, particularly between these two, Gothenburg and Rotterdam. And then you have more inland transport from Helsinki to Genova in Italy and from Bremen to Louvre in, in, in France, which are more, more inland. Uh, there you have inland possibilities. You can use uh, inland waterways, and you can use uh, you can of course also use use coastal uh, shipping here. So the distances <coughs> seems uh, needs to be done again the starting point of the analysis uh, with different different types of transportation. Gothenburg, Aberdeen, by uh, road and rail. I have to say, how the hell are you getting to from Gothenburg to Aberdeen by road? Yes, of course, by using the British Channel, the English Channel, and ferries, short ferry, and road. So it makes sense. It was a bit hard from that map, but of course you can can drive this way. That is why the numbers can become so high, so high here. Uh, you see, also the the distance advantage with uh, with the direct sea sea transport solution, and you have the same for for the other the other links, the other three links. So we see this <coughs> this. Uh, the distance advantages uh, for sea transport, uh, for uh, particularly for for the Gothenburg Aberdeen case, 
And then you need to present the data that or the data sources. Uh, this is the emission rates for different transport modes from the from the national transport model in uh, in, in Norway, which is used. And then load factors, which are derived through the clean shipping process and pro project, load factor for ships. Emissions from trucks based on an, another EU project, the Artemis. And a factor of conversion from deadweight tons to payload used is again based on this project. And you see the numbers here. And actually, there are some keywords like this and this, and if you want to investigate further into into those projects, they have websites, so you can uh, look it up on on Google. Look them up on Google if you want to. Here <coughs> you have the um, Gothenburg Rotterdam um, case, where you have different uh, different types of emissions. Uh, with different units, you have to take take notice of that. There are different units. This is ton per shipment, whereas the other ones has kilos per sh shipment. And the CO two, this difficult, the most difficult emission type to sort of get rid of is CO two. You can handle the others by doing various technical or legal adjustments, but it's very hard to get rid of that one. <coughs> so you see that uh, trucks and train diesel trains, they are performing uh, not, not good at all on, uh, on NOx. Um, again, Things will change a bit from from next year on, also also on the land side here. Uh, but uh, and you also see the difference between diesel trains and electric trains, based on a EU25 mix. And the EU25 mix is kind of important because it gives you uh, or it gives a possibility to calculate. CO2 emissions from electricity, <coughs> because electricity co comes from different sources. Some sources are, are uh, powered by fossil fuels, which causes CO2, whereas other parts are, uh, are supplied by hydropower, biomass power and things like that, and nuclear power, which doesn't emit CO2, but it has some, some other Characteristics connected to safety, but uh, the EU mix is now called the EU27 mix because there are 27 membership countries, and I think, if I remember correctly, that 15.6 percent of the fuel uh, of the uh, electric power pr production comes from hydropower, and 29.3 percent comes from nuclear power. And a smaller fraction from, from biomass and the, lion, uh, and the remaining share, which then should be around 50, comes from fossil fuel burning. Gas, oil and coal. That's why you still have a a uh, significant CO2 emission even if you run the electric trains. You can even find in academic sources that trains have zero emissions. And you can find it in academic sources that electric cars have zero emissions. Which is not true. I uh, was a, <coughs> a reviewer on a on a paper by a, by another researcher, which uh, advocated, he wrote a paper about how we should set the 
taxes for the use of electric vehicles. And he said that, well, they, are they have zero emissions, so they shouldn't have any taxes on, on, uh, on energy. And I, uh, I said that, well, this shouldn't be published unless that is corrected, because uh, here you see this is quite robust evidence telling that there is a smaller amount of CO2 emissions, but they are not zero. And you can say, well, if you take the Norwegian perspective, and that might be valid for other countries as well, saying that, well, we have hydropower, which is more or less, so we are more or less, but not quite self-sufficient with, uh, with energy from hydropower. But at the same time, we have cables connecting us to the European electric market, market for electri electricity, the Swedish market for elect electricity. And the government has now decided to build two new large cables connecting us even tighter to the European electricity market. And in that case, we need to consider the Norwegian electricity market as a part of this market. Because <coughs> I don't know when I make my cup of coffee whether it is fueled by coal or nuclear or gas or whatever. So we need to take that into consideration. Then uh, this is uh, taking 1,000 tons from Gothenburg to Rotterdam. And we have here di distinguished between different types of cargo. And here you see the bulk transport advantage that I talked about. Um, ECI stands for uh, environmental control area, meaning that the ships are have a, a, a emission profile in line with the, the with the, um, with the regulations within the European control agents uh, areas. So we see that <coughs> Roro again comes out as the worst performer of these three ship types, cargo types. And we can here compare with truck train CO2 emissions on the same stretch. We see that there, are, there is uh, still a good profile on the on uh, on CO2 emissions on these three uh, types of sea transport when we take this into consideration tedious work calculating distances load factors engine outtake and everything that lies behind those numbers and the, and the different uh, emission factors. Here, uh, another stretch, Helsinki to Genoa, um, where they have an advantage uh, for uh, road and rail. Um, you have the um, different types of train and the truck here with different emissions based on exactly the same logic as here. Have the ship, the different types of uh, cargo again, bulk, container, row row, and the comparison. And we see that the <coughs> road and rail comes out better than the ship for row row, but not for, for the other two which is in line with, uh, with other findings as well. So the point in showing you this is, uh, first of all, to, to hopefully gain some interest into, into the calculating operations, which is documented in the, in, the, in the articles. But also to say that this is actually important for 
policymakers and planners. Because the planners, they need to cope with political regulations. And political regulations, at best, are founded on findings like this. So if an applicant comes along to say that, well, we need to, to develop a RORO service to replace road transport, then you might say as a, as a decision maker in the EU that, well, perhaps RORO is not the thing that we want to, to, to have more of based on this, on a given, given link. Perhaps more focus on, uh, on transferring containers to, to, to sea transport from road transport. And there are also other aspects here which, is, uh, which needs to be taken into consideration, which has to do with lead time and so on and so forth, which is, uh, which is uh, outlined in the papers. And uh, <coughs> you can read the rest of the presentation uh, for yourselves, uh, at some point in time, I, I say that well, this is not the part of the lecture, but there is some additional material there, additional material for your convenience. Uh, and you may, of course, ask questions if you if you wonder about some of the contents of uh, of of the additional material as well. But um, I know that for some of you, we're going to compare various transport chains in, in an environmental perspective. This, this is actually the setting and the, the way you can proceed with an analysis like that. Should be okay to do that. Okay, then we stop.